Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the third webinar in our series about manufactured housing. Um, so the topic of this webinar today is using federal funding sources to develop manufactured housing. Um, so just a couple of quick notes about housekeeping. Um, so as you can probably all tell, you're automatically muted with your cameras off. Um, we do have the chat feature, so if you um, you should have a toolbar on your right hand side of your screen, um, you will see if you look in the lower right hand corner, um, you might see um, a button with the word chat, or you might just see an icon with a little word bubble. But that, if you push that, that will bring up the chat into your uh, toolbar. Um, so we do ask everyone to please uh, reserve the chat function for your troubleshooting issues. Um, so if you're if you can't see or you can't hear, um, you can drop a note in the chat, address it to host um, in the little drop down menu. There are several options, so um, just address that to host. Um, and then there is also a Q&A feature. So we're trying to save that for the Q&As, um, so the actual questions about the content. Um, so if you look in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, there's three little dots. If you hover on that, you should get an option, uh, a little bubble that says panel options. If you push that, several options will come up. One of them is Q&A. If you push that, then um, it'll bring up a similar uh, little bar that you can type into um, so please address your questions to um, the Q&A and um, just select all panelists from the dropdown so that your questions come to um, all of the panelists today. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and um, after the webinar, we will make the video, a transcription and any other follow-up materials available on the HUD exchange um, just as soon as we can after the webinar. It, it won't be absolutely immediately, but it will be um, as soon as possible so that everyone can get access to those materials. Um, so I'm pleased to introduce our presenters today. So we have with us David Sanchez, a special policy advisor with the HUD Office of Housing, and Stan Fitterman, our subject matter expert in manufactured housing, um, who is helping capital access uh, by presenting today. So Stan and David, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. My pleasure. Um, so for our agenda today is um, we do have quite a bit to get into, even though it looks like a short agenda. Um, so we're going to break down some of the uh, common federal funding sources for manufactured housing activities and some uh, considerations about each one. Um, then going into some just more practical considerations for um, grantees who are implementing manufactured housing activities. Um, then we're thrilled to have with us today um, some grantees who are going to share their experience with um, doing manufactured housing activities. And finally, we'll have time for Q and A. Um, so please, you know, feel free to type your questions into that Q and A box, and then we will have time at the end um, to uh, answer as many questions as we can. Um, so we are, uh, this is the third webinar in the series, as we mentioned, um, and the materials from the previous webinars, again, they're in the process of being posted. I know the first one is already posted and the second one should be posted um, any day now. So you can look for that on the HUD exchange, um, you know, hopefully very soon. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Stan, who's going to walk us through federal funding for manufactured housing. All right, thank you, Catherine. So, all right, so let's talk about federal funding for, for housing. Now, um, the pictures, all the pictures we're gonna be showing you today are of manufactured housing. So there's one with a lovely brick facade. And first, we're gonna start off by talking about the classics, CDBG, CDBG disaster recovery. So in order to use CDBG funds for manufactured housing, it needs to be an eligible activity because that's one of the requirements of all of using CDBG funds. And no surprise, it also has to meet a national objective. So benefit LMI persons, prevent or eliminate slum or blight, or meet an urgent need. Funds may be used for a variety of manufactured housing activities. And as we talked about last week, for those of you that were with us, um, the notice that just came out, 2310, um, has clarified that the acquisition of a newly constructed or existing manufactured home is permitted. It hath provided it's built to the HUD code. 
installation for CDBG and CDBG um, for CDBG is considered new construction of housing, so it needs to be funded by another source, such as home or if you're providing purchase assistance, that's what some of the uh, the mortgage could pay for. All right, and speaking of home, so home can be used in a number of ways to assist manufactured housing. Um, it may be rental or ownership. It can be used for owner-occupied rehab. It can be used for tenant-based rental assistance. Um, here we are. Manufactured housing is, um, is subject to the same home program requirements as any other home-assisted housing. So, for example, affordability period would apply. Um, Home-assisted manufactured units have to meet the HUD code, the Manufactured Home Construction and Safety Standards that we've talked about in previous weeks. And except for owner-occupied rehab, at the time of project completion, the units need to be connected to permanent utility hookups. Okay, we can also do reconstruction with home funds, and reconstruction is considered rehab, and that includes replacing an existing substandard manufactured unit with a new or standard manufactured home. Um, and when we do that replacement, everything has got to be on a permanent foundation. And uh, the permanent, and as we're going to hear from David in a few minutes, the foundation type may affect the ability of a homeowner to obtain financing, especially FHA financing. Installation, again, with home, we can pay for installation. And it must meet all state and local codes, or if there aren't state and local codes, HUD has some model manufactured installation standards that must be followed if we're using home funds. Okay, home art. So this one's new, new-ish, right? Um, eligible activities include non-congregate shelter, tenant-based rental assistance, and rental construction or acquisition of rental housing. Funds for this program, it's designed to help families experiencing homelessness or who are at risk of homelessness. We also can help people who are fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence um, and other populations where providing supportive services or assistance um, prevent, would prevent a family from becoming homeless and veterans also that meet any of these criteria are also at the, the term of art that we have for this are qualifying populations. So with home art, we can use manufactured housing as an eligible expense, but um, we need to remember that we have to serve a qualifying population. Okay, and so some of you may not be as familiar with housing trust funds as you are with some of the other programs we've been talking about because the housing trust fund money goes directly to states. So it goes to the states, uh, DC has got an allocation, Puerto Rico and the territories. And to, to this year, the housing trust fund provided $382 million, $2 million to 56 grantees. It is designed to produce and preserve housing for ELI, for extremely low income and very low income households. 80% of the funds need to go for rental housing. We've got some that can be used for ownership and up to 10% for admin. The stuff it can be used for, the stuff you need to use it for. Acquisition, new construction, site improvements, development costs, soft cost demolition. You can see the list. And you guys also have some available for administrative and planning costs. Okay, for with the housing trust fund, Newly installed or reconstructed manufacturing housing units need to be built according to the HUD code, no surprise. On a permanent foundation, probably not a surprise. Connected to permanent utility hookups, we've been saying that a lot. Um, on land that is owned by the homeowner or for which they have a lease for a period at least equal, equal to the affordability period. So we don't want to put someone into, assist someone getting into a manufactured housing community where we have a 15 year affordability period, for instance, and they have a one year lease. Because as we've talked about in previous sessions, that um, manufactured housing communities sometimes aren't the most stable housing. They can be sold, they can have rents increase. Um, requirements for rehab, foundation and anchoring needs to meet state and local codes or the model manufactured home installation standards. It needs to meet your the property standards that are listed in the regs, 24 CFR Part 93. And as the grantee, you've got to establish property standards for rental housing, including manufactured housing. This is going to apply throughout the affordability period. All right, I'm going to turn it over to David. Um, since he is the expert. And again, that's, I also like that picture a lot too, Catherine, of, the, uh, of that unit. What's All right, David. 
<laughs> uh, great. Well, thank you so much, Stan and Catherine, um, and, and thanks for all of our attendees for for joining today. Um, I'm I'm really excited to be here. Um, my name is David Sanchez. I'm a special policy advisor um, at the Federal Housing Administration. Uh, that that mostly means, uh, practically speaking, that I'm I'm not from the part of HUD that makes grants. I'm from the uh, the part of HUD that insures mortgages. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about what the mortgage options um, or equivalent uh, or, or somewhat equivalent options are for uh, manufactured housing um, home buyers primarily. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit about the financing that connects to manufactured housing communities. Um, so, uh, so FHA uh, was established um, in 1934 during the Great Depression as part of uh, the uh, the, the response to, to that economic event. Um, we um, essentially what we do is we provide um, mortgage insurance to lenders. Um, and what that does is it incentivizes mortgage, uh, these mortgage lenders to make loans, uh, you know, kind of along the terms that, that we encourage or that we allow in our program. Um, what, that, what, that, what that tends to mean um, is that FHA has um, slightly more flexible credit parameters than most other providers of mortgage finance. Um, and so um, borrowers can put um, a minimum of 3.5% down. Um, so it's a smaller down payment than a lot, a lot of other options. And it's also possible that um, depending on the source of down payment assistance, you could use down payment assistance on top of that. Um, we also offer flexible credit parameters. So um, you know, if you have a more of a, like a mid-tier credit score, you might have trouble getting a loan from Another place, uh, but there's a decent chance that you could be approved uh, for an FHA uh, backed mortgage. Um, we also, uh, you know, play a, a bit of a counter cyclical role during challenging economic times when other providers of mortgage credit uh, leave the market. Um, we are there and we are ready to support and we, we played a, a, a big role in the recovery from the, the 2008 financial crisis, for example. Um, and uh, but more broadly speaking, you know, I, I think of FHA as as a as a, a special purpose credit program that serves um, minority borrowers, um, first time home buyers, and those that are less well served by kind of the conventional mortgage market. Uh, then, um, yeah, that's really who 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 we target. Um, when you start thinking about you know how to get a mortgage or a loan for uh, you know the purchase or potentially the refinance of a manufactured home. Um, it's really important, I think, to understand the two different ways that manufactured housing can be titled, um, because the way that it is titled affects um, the type of financing that is eligible for. Um, so manufactured housing can be titled as real estate, you know, as most single-family housing is, and that is when the home and the land are essentially titled together as one unit, and they, they both serve as the collateral on, on the mortgage. Um, manufactured housing can also be titled as personal property, you know, much like a car or an RV. Um, so the, that would be when you are only, um, you know, the only, the only thing that serves as collateral on the loan is the unit itself. It does not include the land underneath. That land can be rented um, as in a manufactured housing community. Um, it could also be um, you know, put on a family member's land. It could be placed on land that is privately owned by the homeowner. But um, you know, for for whatever reason, uh, if if a a manufactured housing homeowner decides not to um, encumber the land, if you will, um, they would they would need to um, receive personal property financing. Um, when you are uh, you know siting and uh, placing a new manufactured home. Um, in order to, uh, in, in many states, it defaults to being personal property, and there are procedures uh, to convert the title to a real estate title. Um, it, those are state-specific procedures, and um, different states, uh, I, I think, have different levels of difficulty in terms of dealing with that process. Uh, you know, some states make it pretty easy to uh, title as real estate, while others, um, you know, it's a little bit more of an involved process that you really need to be. Uh, actively engaged in um, if if you want to title your unit as as real estate. Um, so um, only real estate loans are eligible for what we think of as traditional mortgages. Um, you know, personal property loans do exist, um, but they um, generally have higher interest rates um, and fewer consumer protections than a standard mortgage. There are also fewer um, 
fewer lenders that are active in the space and the, and the federal government, unlike the mortgage space, does not currently play a large role um, in backing these mortgages and, and or these loans. Um, so this is something that I think um, could potentially change in the coming years. FHA, as well as uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are, are exploring the possibilities in this market. Um, and so there might be greater support for personal property manufactured housing loans um, in the future. Um, you know, I, I do think that consumers needed to make an informed choice about how to title their unit. And that's something I really wanted to um, to convey here. Um, you know, it, it, there are, you know, some potential benefits to personal property loans. Uh, you know, you don't need to encumber the land. They may close more quickly. Um, I'm not I'm not here to make, you know, specific advice, but, um, you know, many, um, many consumers who are able to go through the process to title their home as real estate will will probably get better financing terms um, if they are able to access the traditional mortgage market. Um, so uh, FHA, uh, you know, much like the other kind of government supported sources of mortgage credit, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, are, um, you know, we are big backers of manufactured housing titled as real estate. Um, and, and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that goes along with the other flexibilities of, of, of kind of what, what we call our Title II program, which is our mainstream mortgage program. And that's most of what we, we do on the single family side, our, our Title II loans. Um, so it's a really good option uh, for, um, you know, anyone with, with less funds for a down payment um, or, or just who needs a little bit more flexibility in terms of um, qualifying for a mortgage. Uh, as I mentioned, the federal government plays a limited role in the personal property loan market. Um, FHA has the ability to finance uh, these, these uh, personal property loans through its Title I program. That is an, uh, it's, it's a longstanding program that is, as, has for a lot of reasons fallen into disuse. And we um, and Ginny May have requested input on how to revitalize the program. And, um, you know, over the coming months and years, um, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that we'll have um, a number of policy changes that make the program work better for lenders. Uh, so more uh, lenders offer these loans um, and then also would make the program work better for consumers. So, so uh, as I'll, I mean, stay tuned on that. Um, you know, HUD, uh, the Office of Housing, in addition to running uh, the FHA Mortgage Insurance Program, um, we do also run the division that administers the uh, HUD code, the Manufactured Home Construction and Safety Standards, which is a nationwide building code, um, essentially that homes need to be built to. They need to meet our, meet our minimum um, construction and safety standards in order to be called a manufactured home. Um, that's an important distinction um, because modular homes are often made in the same factories as manufactured homes, um, but modular homes are built to local building codes, whereas uh, manufactured homes are built to the standard um, nation, nationwide HUD code. Um, we, uh, in recent years, have worked diligently to update the HUD code uh, to support long-term growth in the manufactured housing sector. Um, you know, I, I should I don't know how much was discussed in in previous webinars, but I think you know all the pictures that are in the um, in this webinar of, of beautiful manufactured homes, they are you know de deliberately chosen to to emphasize the fact that today manufactured homes look much like the the site built homes that most Americans live in and aspire to live in, um, and so uh, you know we. Because we believe that manufactured housing is a great source of affordable housing supply, um, we, we we update the code regularly to ensure that manufacturers can make homes that um, kind of appeal to the standard American home buyer. Um, there is a particular category of manufactured homes that uh, are called cross mod homes, um, or sometimes uh, these these. Um, they're built to standards that are propagated by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So sometimes they're called MH Advantage units or choice home units. The industry-wide term is, is cross-mod. Um, they tend to be slightly higher end homes, um, but they tend to look and feel exactly like site-built homes um, and, and contain many of the you know, features like porches or carports or sloped roofs or things like that that traditional home buyers are looking for in their home. Um, we have recently updated our appraisal policy um, to require um, appraisers to, if they are not a sufficient number of comparable 
cross mod properties um, should be used in an appraisal. Um, we are we are we are asking appraisers to use site built comparisons um, in order to value the properties, and and we think that's an important part of kind of bringing greater acceptance to manufactured housing, um, just in the main in the mainstream housing market. Um, you know, if if a unit isn't titled as real property and is personal property, there are financing options available. Um, as I said, we're we're not currently playing a large role in this market, although it's something that we are exploring and. Um, Hopefully in a few years, we will have positive things to report on that front. Uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, lending on manufactured housing communities. Um, so, uh, you know, I think probably most people on this call are aware, um, but about half of new homes uh, or new shipments tend to be placed in manufactured housing communities rather than on privately, uh, you know, land that is owned by the homeowner or um, land that is leased from, you know, a friend or a relative or, or just on the private market. So these are communities that are specifically created to house manufactured homes. Um, and, uh, and yeah, yeah. So um, the, the um, traditionally the uh, homeowner who owns the home would rent the land underneath their unit in a manufactured housing community. And um, as I, as I think Stan was alluding to, um, you know, it, 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 in that way, it is um, a little bit less of a secure housing option than pure um, home ownership where one owns the land beneath their unit. That being said, manufactured housing communities um, are a source of a lot of affordable housing, um, and we think that they're an extremely part, important part of the um, housing ecosystem um, for uh, essentially, you know, people, people, need, people need a place to live. Um, so uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac play a large role in financing manufactured housing community loans. Um, uh, there are also purely private sources of financing. Um, those tend to focus on, you know, higher income um, or, or higher or, or, or communities with more amenities. You know, there's a lot of talk about kind of senior communities taking off that have, you know, uh, you know, really nice club amenities or things like pools um, uh, on the more moderate um, you know, I guess moderate quality or uh, moderate, less upscale mobile home communities are often funded using uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae financing. Um, we are not in America building um, a whole lot of new manufactured housing communities these days. Um, many, uh, a lot of times the problem there is zoning and local um, jurisdictions pass Zoning codes that make it um, essentially impossible to build new manufactured housing communities. Um, another issue is that um, in in markets where there is strong demand for land, oftentimes it's more profitable to build a condo property or a commercial property on land than it is to build a manufactured housing community. So many of the loans that exist today um, are used to acquire existing MHCs um, or to refinance existing manufactured housing communities. Um, most manufactured housing communities are owned by private investors. Um, the, uh, you know, there are some exceptions where um, government entities, nonprofits, or residents themselves can own uh, manufactured housing communities. And, and uh, in many ways, that addresses some of the housing and security issues that come up in privately owned manufactured housing communities. So, you know, we, we at HUD like to, um, you know, promote those as a as an option to be considered, um, you know, they're not everywhere in the country, but um, a number of states specifically, especially in the Northeast, uh, like New Hampshire, um, have really uh, seen a great proliferation of resident owned communities. Um, and we always want to make sure that folks are aware that that could be an option as a place to site um, a new manufactured housing unit um, or to purchase an existing um, manufactured housing unit. Um, I would also add that when Fannie and Freddie finance these loans, they do require um, a certain baseline of tenant protections to protect the manufactured housing homeowners who do not own the land underneath their unit. Um, and these are things about, uh, you know, notification of rent increases, notification of park closure, um, you know, ability to sell the home in place um, or sublet the home, um, things like that. So things that give um, tenants a little more stability um, and uh, and not 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 quite ownership of the land, but you know it it, it, it it's intended to mirror some of those rights that um, a, a landowner would would be able to enjoy um, if they if they did own the land. 
Um, so I'll stop there. Um, and I'm really excited to, uh, you know, to hear your question, your questions. I'm going to turn it back to Stan to um, walk us through the next part of the presentation. All right, thank you, David. And to be clear, so the Fannie and Freddie's product will finance the uh, the development of a new community, if it's possible, as well as the acquisition of an existing one. Um, let me double check on that, Stan. Actually, okay. while I'm, all right, while I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, while we're on the line, the, yeah. let me let me double okay. check. Yeah. Okay, it was just one of the questions we had. I thought I'd get to it while you were awesome. while I had you. All right, thank you. Okay, practical considerations. So, zoning, I mean, as, as David said, you know, there are uh, zoning and manufactured housing. Um, a lot of zoning ordinances haven't caught up with the, the, uh, with the vocabulary, with the difference in terms from, you know, a lot of the zoning ordinances still use the term mobile homes. There are communities out there whose zoning codes prohibit manufactured housing. In virtually every residential district, or sometimes in every residential district, and only allow them to go into manufactured housing communities. And I think it's one of the reasons we want to talk about this. It's extremely important before you start making decisions on manufactured housing activities, financing them, seeing them as a part of your affordable housing delivery system, that it's important to know where they're allowed in your community and whether your zoning code is kind of caught up with where these. The types of homes that are being built today versus the pre 76 metal on metal flat roof units that are, you know, now approaching 50, 60, 70 years old. Um, so, as we said, some communities prohibit manufactured housing in virtually every residential district. Some limit them to only being able to be done in manufactured housing communities. A new, as David, again, as David said, 1 of the ways that these are often. Uh, new manufactured housing communities are prohibited is they have to go through a plan development process. And anytime you see plan development process and a zoning code, the little cash register should go off over your head. And also, it also takes longer to get through that process. It also can be, um, since it's a public hearings are usually required, it can also lead to NIMBY. Um, now, some communities have, um, a zoning category that restricts a property's use to a manufactured housing community. And in these cases, that would mean that if someone wanted to sell that land for another use, that they would have to get a zone change, which is a public process, which means that the residents of that community could come to the public hearing and speak against changing the zoning to something other than the manufactured housing community. So this has been a way to try and slow the redevelopment of some of these of existing manufactured housing communities. Um, in addition, some manufactured housing communities no longer comply with current zoning, so they are valid non-conforming uses. But if you're going to redevelop or rehab or change more than a certain percentage of the replacement cost of the development, it could trigger all new codes, and all new codes could mean you know, change, changing the streets to make them wider, uh, adding sidewalks, uh, upgrading infrastructure. It could mean that lot sizes are no longer um, in compliance. So they would have, you don't, would not be able to get as many units back on it if you were to redevelop. So, and this is especially important when dealing with community development block grant disaster recovery funds after a, a natural disaster that redeveloping these these homes and under those circumstances could mean that it's not possible to redevelop as a manufactured housing community. So zoning is still an issue that we have to deal with, you know, not only in affordable housing in general and density, but also especially when we're looking at uh, manufactured housing. Ensuring manufactured housing. So it's required if there's a mortgage on the unit, it's obviously a good practice, even if there's not a mortgage on the unit. Mortgage units located in a floodplain must have flood insurance. If we're redeveloping, I'm going a little bit off slide here, but if we're redeveloping, um, we also in a floodplain, we have to make it unit above base flood elevation. Um, and insurance can be expensive, especially depending on where you live. You live in the Gulf Coast of the US, insurance is going extremely high uh, in Florida. Uh, which a market I'm familiar with, insurance companies are pulling out of the state. So, locating, location in a disaster prone area, it's going to have our, our 
our uh, insurance higher. Since we're dealing with folks who have limited resources, putting some uh, manufactured home in a floodplain, developing in a floodplain, not only do we be more expensive because we have to go above base flood elevation, but the ongoing cost of maintaining that home is going to be more expensive because someone's going to have to pay for flood insurance. Age and condition of home, of course, determine it. What the replacement cost is versus the actual cash value of the home also has an effect on insurance rates. And of course, like with, with all insurance policies, whatever your limits are, including your deductible, are also going to uh, have influence how much your monthly payment is going to be for insurance. And getting back to some of the HUD regulations. Now, um, cross-cutting regulations and other requirements are going to apply to CDBG and DR, home, the subsidy programs we talked about. Um, so we've got so with CDBG, DR, and HOME, including HOME ARP, we've got to follow the environmental review policy. So 24 CFR Part 50 is the one where HUD does it. Part 58 is the one we're most familiar with, which is when the responsible entity, being the local government, usually is the one that does that. The level of review for manufactured housing is going to do the same as a site build house. It depends on the scope. It'll either be category excluded subject to, or new construction could be an environmental assessment. Again, it's the same standards we use when we're developing site build housing. The housing trust fund follows environmental revisions, um, follows standards that are written in their rules for new construction and rehab of manufactured housing. Um, labor standards, Davis-Bacon extended DBRA applicability to offsite work, including factory production of manufactured homes. Section 3 may qualify if removing people, Uniform Relocation Act, and Section 104D, which is the part of that act that applies to low-income families, applies as well. So one thing to keep in mind, that would potentially come into place if we're redeveloping a manufactured housing community, especially after um, a natural disaster, that there may be folks who were displaced that are eligible for relocation assistance. And we also need to be mindful that relocation assistance, especially if we trigger 104D, can be very expensive. Because not only removing people, we also potentially could be paying a portion of their rent for quite some time, 42 months, I believe. Um, um, and then, of course, uh, FHA and the manufactured housing community loans with Fannie and Freddie, we're going to have the third party reports, appraisals, phase one environmental assessment, property condition reports. Just like any other loan that you're getting, they're going to make us. They're going to go through their due diligence as well for for making that loan. You know, this is also along with zoning, community outreach, community engagement. It's crucial to be implementing a successful manufactured housing activities. Um, we're talking about you know. If we're going to be changing zoning, or if we're going to be pushing to have uh, uh, manufactured housing allowed in single-family residential districts, and you know, tip on all residential districts, folks are going to need to understand that we're putting in homes that look like site-built homes, and codes can be written so the design standards are there that that's the type of homes that that are allowed. Um, if we're doing redevelopment of a manufactured housing community. We've got folks that are going to be very concerned they're going to lose their house or lose their place to live or lose their affordable place to live. So communicating with stakeholders early, often, being extremely transparent about how you're designing and financing and what the rents are going to be, extremely important. Um, it's also important to listen to folks and respond to them. Yes, there are some people that say things that may not be appropriate or what you would want to do, but it's important to listen to the majority of people to get a sense of what they want in their community, especially when we're talking about re redeveloping manufactured housing communities. And there's data, case studies, resident stories. We're going to show some more photos in a minute. There's also, we're going to listen to, um, hear from grantees' own experience, heard from grantees' experiences, some of the earlier sessions as well, about how to, to um, dispel a lot of the outdated perceptions and promote the facts about what manufacturing housing means today, such as um, how manufactured housing communities are neighborhoods. And we talked about in the first session that they're no more transient than site-built subdivisions. 
manufactured housings aren't moved. Uh, it costs between seven and ten thousand dollars to move one. Sometimes they physically can't be moved in the older ones that are in manufactured housing communities. Um, so as a result, they are as they they don't go anywhere. Um, there is certainly evidence that manufactured homes on single family lots appreciate in value. Uh, we talked about in an earlier session in 2018, the American uh, Housing Survey uh, brought in some data on appreciation in manufactured homes, showing that those on single family lots, especially those that look like the ones in this picture, do appreciate at similar rates to site build housing. There's also some evidence, but not great evidence yet, that homes in resident owned communities um, also appreciate in value. Manufactured housing is resilient, especially those built after 1994. The change to the code in 1994 um, um, resulted in homes being able to survive high winds and earthquakes much better than the pre-1994 ones units. And HUD did a study in 2000 after the 2004 hurricanes in Florida, um, especially after Charlie, which came across Southwest Florida, where there were a number of manufactured housing communities and a number of manufactured housing and found that the ones that were built after 1994 to those standards did as well as site built homes. The ones built between 76 and 94 did better than the ones that were built pre 1976. So the pre 1976 ones weren't built to any real codes. Those still struggled at in in the high winds, but those after 1994 did as well as site built homes. Manufactured housing is built to high standards. You know, again, as we've talked about previously, before 1990, 1976, it was a patchwork of codes. They were voluntary codes. The homes may not have been, were not built as well as site built homes. Now we're building homes that have similar materials, use the same materials, have similar codes, and, um, and look good. And so overall, you know, this industry, the manufactured housing industry has evolved to where they're building more and more units that look, as David mentioned too with the cross mod, that look like and feel like site build homes. And I think it's important, um, yeah, and it's important to note too that, you know, by calling these manufactured homes, it, this is not just rebranding. We're not taking, it's not like taking Cheerios and putting them in a new box, but you still have Cheerios. These are a different product than what used to be called mobile homes in the pre-1976 days, where that they are dealt to, again, limited standards, limited safety standards, limiting codes, and they didn't look like site building units. These units are different than what um, some folks' perception is of when they hear manufactured homes. Okay, so my favorite part of these sessions has been when we get to talk to grantees or we're doing stuff. So today we are thrilled to have with us um, Tina Martinez, who's the Director of uh, Community Development for the City of Laredo, Texas, and Marcela Cervantes, who is Program Administrator for the Department of Community Development of City of Laredo, Texas. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and we just have a couple of questions I wanted to ask you all. And Marcella, is all right? I'm going to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about your manufactured housing projects, the type, kind of units, and funding sources, and anything else you'd like to say about them? Yes, of course. Um, the City of Laredo Department of Community Development administers the housing rehabilitation program through the Community Block Grant Program, CDBG, and a homeowner reconstruction program through the Home Investment Partnership Program. Um, through this program, income eligible homeowners are provided assistance for repairs or replacement of their manufacturing housing units. We offer a livability grant program, which is to make repairs to roof, electrical, plumbing system, and to make modifications to address handicap accessibility and other housing components that if left uncorrected would pose a life threatening hazard or hardship to the occupants of the housing units. Um, we provide assistance up to $15,000 um, to be eligible to qualify for the livability grant program. Applicants must be homeowners, occupants, 
and qualify under the low and moderate income guidelines. There is no lien based on their home and there's no repayment. We also have a reconstruction loan, which is for the replacement of dilapidated manufacturing housing units. Assistance is in form of a 0% interest loans and they're available for qualifying low income, low and moderate income owner occupants in the amount necessary to purchase that affordable replacement unit. It's installation and disposal of the dis dilapidated manufacturing unit. Um, qualifying homeowners will be responsible to pay 57% of the loan and 43% will be forgiven. Forgiven. Um, within it, there also we also provide 100% forgivable loans for the elderly or disabled households. So those are the two programs that we currently have with the city of Laredo. Um, on the reconstruction loan, we do require once the unit has been replaced, there is, the homeowner is responsible to have homeowner insurance and have their taxes paid at all times. Um, through the livability grant program, we have assisted, we, we assisted the project's 20% are manufacturing housing units. All right, well, thank you. So, Tina, what led y'all to decide to do manufactured housing activities? So, um, of course, community need, need, right? So, of course, our community development block grants and home investment partnership grants should always, you know, gear, be geared to what your community needs. Um, and just as Marcela mentioned, these two programs that we run um, that address uh, manufactured, manufactured homes in our community, um, you know, we've we've had to, you know, modify um, and change policies and procedures based on the need in our community. So um, being aware of what our community needs um, and, and being able to adjust to it and always, you know, um, ensuring that we are in compliance with any updates and any notices um, that HUD gives us, of course, but Another um, reason that we are in the manufacturing housing activities in our community is cost, right? So um, cost is a, is a main factor of what type of affordable housings are built in your community. Cost affects, you know, um, any decision, be it a homeowner or a developer or a city affordable housing project, it's always cost, right? So we see that um, manufacturing homes is, is something that our community is still um, being able to, um, I guess, um, you know, they, our community still need, right? Because of cost. Uh, but also um, we've, we've um, you know, we work with manufacturing housing activities projects because we also see that um, the hardships that um, to maintain these um, units um, are usually geared toward our low income communities, right? So our property owners, you know, um, you know, the majority, like uh, Marcela said, um, the majority of our housing rehabilitation program projects um, are manufactured homes in our community because um, for one reason or another, um, they're usually going to um, be in, in our community. They're usually some low income areas of town. So we want to ensure that our programs uh, match up for their needs. Yeah, makes total sense. Did you have any challenges navigating requirements of the sources you're using for these? Yes, of course. I mean, when you <laughs> try to, <laughs> yeah, of course, <laughs> right? so when, when you, when you try to layer different uh, programs, um, you just need to ensure that you understand the limits and the, the requirements of each funding source. So just because um, maybe your CDBG grant allows you to do X, Y, and Z, um, but not, you know, but not A, right? right. So right. Um, you, you may be able to plan out um, what other funding source can be layered to it is great. Um, well, we've, we've made sure to ensure that those challenges are not um, stopping factors or, you know, that they don't kill a deal or kill a project is we make sure that our policies and procedures always reflect what the grant it requires. Um, I always encourage, you know, any new community or our, our staff to make sure that we have checklists 
that can basically outline what you can do with each of the grants. So that way, when you have a project and program, you can make sure that you're layering the right um, funding source to that project or program. Yeah, I'm a big fan of the checklist. Mm -hmm. They do seem, they really, they really do help, especially when you have new staff as Correct. well, mm -hmm. but also for existing staff. It's just an easy way to make sure you haven't forgotten something and it's an easy way to check for if you did something wrong that you need to correct before you finalize things. Correct. So, Marcella, back to you. Um, what advice would you give to other grantees who are considering implementing similar programs to what you've done, which what y'all have described? My recommendations for them will be to understand the federal program laws and regulations, as well as get familiarized with their local building codes. Um, create a policy and procedure manual to establish a framework that guides the operations of the program. And like Ms. Martinez mentioned, to create a project checklist to ensure compliance and that all requirements are being met. Those are my recommendations, our recommendations. All right. Anything else either of y'all wanna add that we? We do have a question that came through as well as we're oh, okay. speaking with the folks from, from Laredo. Um, someone asked, does the city of Laredo own most of the land these communities are located on? The project that we spoke about are more um, homeowner uh, rehab programs. Uh, we are looking into expanding some of the projects on city owned land. So we are um, right now in the development phase of looking at some city owned property, how we could layer in some manufactured homes or um, some, you know, pre built or, you know, we're, we're trying to see the assessment of that. But my advice would be first look at what land is available by the city. Right. All right. Well, well thank, thank you both. both. So yeah. Good. Oh, I was just going to say the exact same thing you did. <laughs> thank you so much for for taking the time to be with us this afternoon. Thank you for inviting us, and we we enjoyed this uh, webinar. Great. So, Catherine, we have a few questions. We do have a few questions and just, yeah, before we get into the questions, I just want to um, let everyone know that uh, we have added another webinar to this series. So on November 29th, we will be doing a webinar specifically around the topic of frequently asked questions on manufactured housing. Um, a lot of the content of that webinar will be um, questions that came through in these webinars that we um, either weren't able to get to during the time we had, or maybe there's um, some follow-up information. So um, all of that is the preface um, to say that um, we'll, we'll take the time we can to answer the questions and it looks like there's a lot of really great questions coming through. Um, so I'm going to, um, you know, I'll go ahead and read them and it, it is possible that we might, um, you know, pause on some of them and save them for the FAQs if either we don't have the person um, or people, you know, here that are the experts on that topic today or if there's just not time, um, but, you know, let's jump in. <laughs> Uh, so, um, we did have a question, does HUD have a loan product that serves ITIN loans? So, that's, I believe, individual taxpayer ID number loans. Um, is that something that we're able to answer? Um, yeah. Um, so, um, un unfortunately, um, FHA-supported financing is, is limited to those who are um, lawful permanent residents. Um, so, one doesn't need to be a citizen um, in order to... Uh, access an FHA backed loan. Um, it is, but you do need to be, um, you need to be the, meet the definition of a lawful permanent resident. Um, so that can include, you know, folks who are in, in DACA, for example, uh, but it, it wouldn't include, um, you know, many of the folks who, um, you know, folks would be trying to serve through an ITIN loan. Um, and those, those, um, you know, those restrictions come from, from Congress. Um, and so, um, unfortunately, the law. Sorry, uh, it looks like maybe David, your your sound cut out. Okay, I thought it was me. I no, I lost everybody. Um, All right, but thank you for that response. Anyway, that I think was very informative. What what uh, we did get. So, um, yes, I'll go ahead and move on. So we we did receive a couple of questions about uh, Build America Buy America and how that is going to affect um, manufactured home programs. 
Um, so I don't know if it's possible to give um, any general guidance on that. I do think that might be a, um, a little bit more substantive. So that would be a good one to save for the FAQs, but, um, but Stan, if, um, you know, Stan or David or anyone, you know, feel free to, to chime in on that. Uh, if, if there's anything to say at the moment. I know build America by America is a complex topic and I'm not an expert on it. Um, I would say, I don't believe that there are any um, folks who are building homes to the HUD code to the manufactured housing code um, that are uh, located outside of the United States, at least not as far as I'm aware. Um, obviously there's a number of, uh, there's a lot of modular housing producers who um, are located internationally, but um, I'm not aware of, and Stan, you should correct me if, if, I, if you know that I'm wrong. No, I don't know. Yeah, no, I, that sounds, it does sound right from what I know about the industry. Um, yeah, well, and you would have um, like cost reasonableness requirements and everything too. So um, that would also somewhat indirectly affect uh, Build America by America and just in terms of, um, you know, the cost of uh, purchasing internationally versus a similar product that's available domestically. Um, but yeah, that one, um, we, we can certainly try to, um, you know, respond in the FAQ webinar and if there's anything else to add on that. Um, so the next question is, do HUD standards allow for solar energy programs? I presume that is in manufactured housing. Um, I think we need yeah, Jason for uh, that, but go ahead, David. Uh, you know, I would say in, in terms of the HUD code, um, yes, you can absolutely put um, solar units, uh, you know, solar um, panels on a manufactured home, um, and it wouldn't, you know, uh, invalidate anything after the the home has been placed. Um, I, I I believe that we do not currently um, in the HUD code um, have an option where manufacturers can install solar panels in the factory. Um, they would need to be installed after the unit is placed on um, where whatever land it's it's placed on. So. Um, that's my understanding of how it would work. We, I mean, one of the reasons why HUD does get so excited about manufactured housing is because we think it has great potential to be, and often is, um, more energy efficient than site-built homes. Um, and I know that you know certain lenders, um, you know, for example, um, Clayton Homes, um, is 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 making a big splash about building to the most um, efficient, energy efficient codes possible. So, um, so you know, I just offer that as some additional thoughts on the general topic. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is about insurance. So um, the note is that most manufactured housing insurance does not cover full replacement costs regarding underground utilities or roads. Um, does the CDBG program require a full replacement policy? And that is something we can, again, potentially do some research on if we need to. Yeah, I think we might need to do a little more research. Um, uh, there is uh, 2 CFR Part 200, 310 covers insurance coverage, and it says the non-federal entity must, at a minimum, provide the equivalent insurance coverage for real property equipment acquired or improved as provided to property owned by the non-federal entity. So I think what many people do initially, and, and I, um, uh, I think Tina mentioned this, that does require folks to have uh, insurance when they rehab um, a unit. I don't know how long that, re that requirement, you know, may be in place for the length of the term of the loan. Um, but many communities, you know, requ do require folks that have rehab to have insurance. If someone has a mortgage and often we're not 100% financing acquisition with our CDBG or home program, so there'll be a first mortgage, those always require insurance. Oh, and yeah, actually, um, some additional information. So the CDBG regulations don't specifically require full replacement. Um, a CDBG grantee, whether city or state, might have additional requirements on that. But as far as um, you know, the, the federal requirements, that's not specifically in there. However, Section 202A of the Flood Disaster Protection Act of 1973 and its implementing regulations um, do apply to CDBG funds. So if it's in a floodplain, you're needing to have flood insurance. Yeah, so that's potentially. Yeah, that's that's the, sh the short answer on that one, right? Right, so that's okay. uh, section 202A 
of the Flood Disaster Protection Act of 1973, which is um, 42 U.S. Code 4106, and the regulations are 44 CFR parts 59 through 79. So, in case All right, you great. research that further. Um, so, are, are there any HUD capital grants available or coming available soon specifically for the development of cross-mod housing units or communities? Um, no, I don't think specifically um, in terms of targeting um, cross-mod homes or communities. Um, I know that um, our, um, our, our our Office of Community Planning and Development, um, who are the host of this webinar, although I'm not technically part of that office, um, are looking forward to rolling out a really innovative program that will help improve existing manufactured housing communities and the quality of the infrastructure within them. Um, you know, it is possible. I know some of that will focus on replacement housing, um, and it is possible that um, you know older substandard units could be replaced with with cross mod homes. Um, but so that that that's what I'm aware of, um, and then if, if others know more about potential um, things coming from HUD, I'd love to. Yeah, please jump in. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if anyone has anything to add, but um, that was super helpful. And we have a couple more questions, and I think a couple more minutes. So I'll I'll go ahead and keep moving. So a um, couple of questions. Number one, if if replacing existing units, do the new units need to match the size of the existing units? For instance, um, does a single ra single wide need to replace be replaced with another single wide? Um, and then any guidance or best practices in the removal or disposal of existing units. Um, any thoughts about that? I admit I don't think I know the answer to that question. So we could look. We we should look into it. Yeah, um, I mean, as far as just removal and disposal, um, certainly I could just say that um, there are requirements as far as lead and asbestos. Um, you know, those are um, so lead would be would be part of the federal regulations. Asbestos, um, you know, would depend potentially on state regulations, but requiring dumpster certifications is a common practice um, with the with the removal and disposal. Um, however, we can try to answer that question more thoroughly in the FAQs. Let's see. Has any grantee or organization been successful in developing infill housing or planned developments using manufactured housing and layering with other affordability components such as a community land trust? Yes. Or did you want more than that? <laughs> If you got more than that, <laughs> um, I know Vermont has done that, um, and I believe there's someone here actually um, who's from uh, the uh, state of Vermont. Um, one of it was participating. So, but they, I believe, they have done that, and with community land trust, where the community land trust owns the the land underneath and leases it to the the residents of the manufactured housing community, and because they are a nonprofit with a mission of maintaining long term affordability. They are um, not interested in redeveloping the site at some point for a higher and uh, more uh, uh, more advantageous it. use, yeah, and for for to make more money. So, um, yes, yeah, so I know Vermont has done that. We had Molly from New Hampshire last week. I believe they have done they have financed that as well. That's where Rock, the resident-owned community CDFI, is based, and so they have done. Um, they have also done that. Um, as well, in terms of infill, was that part of the question of, of doing it? I thought, in, yeah. At neighborhoods, well, even if it wasn't, I'll answer it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, uh, infill's harder sometimes because of zoning, so you just have to make sure that zoning would permit it in the district, the zoning district you're in before you do uh, something like that. Um, great, thank you. That gives people a lot of um, potential uh, avenues to research online. Um, and last question. I think this might be a quick one. Um, can a properly built and compliant tiny home be financed through Title I? Um, that's a great question and thank you. Um, so um, tiny home, there are many tiny homes that, and most tiny homes are not built to the manufactured housing code. 
Um, so it would have to be a tiny home that was specifically built to the HUD manufactured housing code um, in order to be eligible for that that title that title one program that you were talking about. Um, it is possible, um, however, to um, to fund uh, accessory dwelling units through FHA's um, you know rehabilitation and standard mortgage programs, and, and it's also possible to fund modular units. So while it might not fall specifically under our manufactured housing programs, um, we would we would probably have a means to support it as long as it was built to um, to the local zoning code. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so that is all the time we have, and it looks like that is um, got through, I think, pretty much all of the questions. So um, that concludes our webinar today. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for attending and for your great questions. Thank you to our speakers and our grantee panelists for um, sharing their insights with us today. Just a, a couple of notes. So um, here's some information on your screen about the frequently asked questions webinar, which is on November 29th. And then um, the final webinar in our series is Manufactured Housing and Tribal Communities, and that will be on December 6th. The registration for those two should be opening any time if it isn't already open. So please keep your eyes out for that. As a reminder, the materials from this webinar will be shared via the HUD exchange just as soon as they're available. It's not going to be like immediately after this webinar, but it, it will be just as soon as we can. Um, so thank you again, everyone and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.